1 Samuel 10, 25. I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. The Bible says like this. Are you there? 1 Samuel 10, 25. The Bible reads like this. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty. Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty. He wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away. Every man to his own house. Father, we thank you for your spirit. I pray you move here today. In the name of Jesus, we pray and say, amen. Here this morning, I want to talk to you with the title called Royals. Royals. Now, I believe that everyone here, you have to come to an understanding that God is doing something new within your life. And I love what Samuel begins, what we read here in the book of Samuel. And Samuel says this. He says that he explained to the people of Israel the behavior of royalty. Now, you have to understand that Israel was in bondage. Israel were slaves. Israel did not really understand everything to do with royalty. But he, there were people that God had brought out, out of circumstance, out of, you know, bondage. But he brought them out. Out. How many thank God that he's brought you out? Come on, he's brought you out. He's brought you out of many situations. He's brought you out of trials. He's brought you out this morning. And the, we, feel, we see here that they're in a place where they wanted a king, but they didn't really understand what it meant to be under rules or under this, this ruleship. And so the Bible says that Samuel began to explain to the people the behavior of royalty. Royalty has a certain behavior. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, but you are not that. You are a chosen people. I love that first part of that verse. It says that you are not that. Whatever that was in your life, you ain't that no more. Whatever you were before you came to God, you are not that no more. I don't know what your that was, but you are not that anymore. Stop claiming that. Stop talking about that. Stop saying you're still bound to that because the Bible says who the sun sets free. He said, you ain't that for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possessions. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he had called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. How many thank God that he chose you? I said, how many thank God that he chose you? You are a royal priesthood this morning. You have been hand selected by the king of kings, the creator of all things, the one who placed the skies above, the one who made something out of nothing. He looked at you and said, I'm choosing that one. I want that one. And I want this one. He has chosen you this morning. He has chosen you. And here today, I want you to begin to realize that you are just not an ordinary person. You have been chosen by God. You are not here by chance. You are not here by mistake. You didn't just stumble upon this church. God has called you here. He's called you here. When you realize who you are, you won't settle for who you're not. When you realize who you are, you're not going to settle for who you are not. I think for many years, many of us, we came to a place where we have settled for the lies of the enemy. We have settled that we're not good enough. We have settled within our lives that we can't open a business. We can't be successful. We can't serve God. I can't fulfill my calling. That is a lie. Don't settle for who you are not. When God has destined you for greatness, can somebody say amen? See, you got to know who you are this morning. Somebody say, I'm royal. You got to know who you are today. You are a child of God, and you have been chosen by God. Can somebody say, yeah? yeah. 
Billy Graham was once asked, will you run for office? He said, no, that would mean I would have to step down because I work for the king of kings. He said, I don't want to be president. I don't want to run for office because I work for the king of kings. When you know who you are, when you know what you carry, you carry it a different way. You don't settle for who you are not. When you speak about royalty, royalty has a behavior. It refers to the expectations or conduct and etiquette of those members that are in the royal family. And I believe that many of us, you got to know that you are royal. Now, I looked up some of the things that royal families do. Royal families, they begin to do certain things and they act certain ways. They display proper manners and etiquette and etiquettes when it comes into social status. They have a certain way about them. They understand that they represent their country, but they represent it with grace. They represent it with grace. They maintain a dignified and regal bearing at all times. In other words, nothing it's going to shake them. They'll always have a smile on their face because they've been trained to carry themselves as royal. They understand who they are. They understand what they carry. They understand the name that they hold. But do you know that you hold the name above all names? They maintain a sense of humility. Despite of their status and privileges, they carry themselves a certain way. When it comes to being royals, we have to carry ourselves a certain way. We're just not ordinary people anymore. You're just not an ordinary people. When people see you at your workplace, you might feel like you're ordinary at that workplace, but you're not. You should stand out a little bit. They should be like, what's wrong with this brother? He drinks his coffee like this. <laughs> when they start asking you questions, you'll be like, I'm royal. I'm from the royal priesthood. I'm a holy nation. God's called me. But I believe that in having these characteristics, there's some few things that I want to mention you, to you today. Is that cool? Can I mention to you a, a few things here this morning? The first thing I want you to write down, I want you to write this down. Put first things first. When you're royal, you got to remember there's first things are first. You know that the first belongs to the Lord. That is the first of your day. Many of you came on this Sunday. You are putting God first. This is the first of your day. This is also a, a place where we understand that we put our first into our finances. That our finances belong to God. That we put him first. We put him where he belongs. That is in your place, in your time, in order, or in rank. I believe that there's something that we need to learn. We need to learn how to put God first. Putting God first is so important. This is a fundamental principle that we could apply at all aspects of our life. Whether in relationship our work, or our spiritual life, when you put God first, something begins to happen in your life. Because you learn how to prioritize God. If there's anything we need to learn, is how to prioritize God. Putting God first is so important for you and I. We have to put God first. You know that verse where it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven? Well, that Greek word there, seek, when you look out, when you really look into it, that means to seek something after. In other words, you have an intention. I'm seeking after this. I'm seeking after that. You ever lost your keys and you're really on a rush and you're like intentionally seeking? You're blaming your wife, your dog. You're blaming everybody in the house. You took them. You took them. No, I did not take them. You misplaced, but you're seeking frantically. Well, that's the same word. He's saying when you seek God's kingdom, seek them with an intention. 
Seek them like you're looking for something. Seek them like you need them. Seek them like you can't live without them. Seek him. I read this cool quote by this author, Wally Lamb. He says, the seeker embarks on a journey to find what he wants and discovers along the way what he needs. You could start looking around, but as you start looking around, you're going to really find what you need. Many of us this morning, that's why you feel the way you feel today. Because you finally found what you needed. You've been seeking and seeking and looking and searching. But this last weekend, you ended up here. This last month, you ended up here. Maybe you've been here for a few years, but you finally found what you really needed in your life. You finally found what you needed in your life. Seeking the kingdom of God first or putting God first is very important when you look at, at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit unto him. And he will make your crooked paths straight. I believe that many of us here today, we have to begin to prioritize God. When you live a royal life, you understand who you're under. You understand that he's first in your life. You prioritize him. You put him in his place. You wake up in the morning and you seek him because you say, God, I need to prioritize you. I need to put you first in my life. Are you hearing me today? I think that is what we need here this morning. We need to allow God to be first in our lives. Are you hearing me? The second thing I want you to remember and I want you to write down, very important for you. It says, never forget what is most important. Never forget what is most important. You know, Pastor Miller, a few years ago, I bought this nice white boat. So cool. Such a nice boat. My wife and I were like, let's take this boat out. And we're like, all right, let's do it. So the night before, you know, I prepped everything. I got a cooler. I was like, yo, we go out there. I got a cooler. I got grapes, we got sodas, drinks, we got everything. Gatorade, we had zeros, we had, you know, sparkling water, we had everything. Life jackets, I mean, we went all, I was like, yo, we about to have fun. So we jump in the, in the, in the truck and we're driving to this place. We literally drive about an hour and a half to this lake I really wanted to visit. I was like, man, I heard this lake's beautiful. It's clear. It's, oh, man, we're going to have a great time. You know what? Matter of fact, we're going to take my mom with me. We, we had all kinds of people with us. We are like, yo, it's going to be great. We're having an awesome time. So I pull up, and the lake, I'm like so excited. I'm juiced. I'm like, yo, the lake's right there, dude. <laughs> Ooh, right? We're about to have fun. So I said, all right, cool, let's, let's get this thing going. So I jump out of the truck. I start prepping everything, loosening up tires and all this stuff. I'm like, all right, let's do this. So I jump in the boat, and I go, okay, we're about to go down. And I was like, yo, hey, Carmen. Carmen, where's the keys to the boat? She said, what? I said, look, Puerto Rican, where are the keys to the boat. She said, oh, I took them out last night because I didn't want nobody to steal the boat. <laughs> Where are they going to drive the boat, girl? Are you kidding me? I was like, what in the world? But I learned a valuable lesson that day, Pastor Al. It wasn't about the drinks. <laughs> It wasn't about the grapes. At that moment, I go, we ain't going nowhere without no keys. I'm not driving back an hour and a half to go get them. I said, I'm going old school. I'm about to hotwire this thing. I was like, let's go. I'll tell you what. She don't touch those keys no more. But I'll never forget it because that was the most important thing 
And all of a sudden, I bypassed the most important thing. How many times in life do we say, oh, it's about this, it's about that, it's about this, it's about that. I got this, I got that. Oh, we doing good. I got me another house. But what about the most important? What about the most important thing? The most important thing is so valuable to you and I. Jeremiah 2, verse 32, it says, Does a young woman forget her jewelry or bride her wedding dress? Yet for years, on end, my people have forgotten me. On a special day, ain't nobody forgetting their dress. Jewelry. But God says, for years on end, you forget me. Forgetting God is not a good thing. Forgetting God will eventually lead you to rebellion. I found it in Psalms 106 verse 6. Watch this. It says, like your ancestors, we have sinned. We have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. Our ancestors in Egypt will not be impressed by the Lord's miraculous deeds. They soon forgot as many acts of kindness to them. Instead, they rebelled against him at the Red Sea. What is he saying? He's saying soon they forgot everything that God has done within their lives. And they went to a place of rebellion in their hearts. If there's one thing you and I cannot uh, 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 find ourselves doing is forgetting what's important. Forgetting what's important. Don't ever forget what God brought you from. Don't ever forget the miracles God's done in your life. Don't ever forget the promises that he's releasing to your family. Don't ever forget the most important thing, how he rescued you when you were in that pit and he pulled you out. Don't ever forget that season you went through, but he didn't allow you to stay in it. He said, I got more. Don't ever forget what's important. Don't ever forget that you need God in your life. Moses knew that he needed God. Moses was one that he understood that he needed God. See, Moses knew God, but Israel knew the works of God. They didn't know the the ways of God. They just knew his works. And sometimes living a royal life, we just know his works, but we don't know his ways. And God wants you to know his ways. He wants you to know how he moves. He wants you to know how he thinks. He wants you to know there's more for you and your family. You got to start knowing his, his ways. His ways. I found an interesting story about Moses in Exodus 33 verse 12. The Bible says, one day Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, these people uh, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me told me whom you will send with me you have told me I I I know you by name and you look favorably upon my life so in other words he's having this conversation with God and he's saying okay you say I have favor you want me to do these things right but I love what what Moses said Moses says this he says if you don't personally go with us don't make us leave this place Don't make us leave this place. He says, how would anyone know that you look favorably on me and your people if you don't go with us? If you don't go with us. For your presence among us sets your people, that means you, us, and me apart from everyone else in the world. I love this story. Because God's telling him to move, but he says, I'm not going to move. God, I'm not going to go anywhere unless you'll go with me. He understood if I'm going anywhere, I need the keys with me. If you're going to lead me somewhere, I ain't going alone. I got to have the most important thing. And the most important thing in my life is you. 
You better not move out of the place that God has you if he's not going with you. God has you where he has you and he's with you at this moment, but don't dare step outside of that. He said, I'm not leaving this place, and I love this part so much. He says, for your presence sets us apart from everyone on this earth. If there's anything that's going to set you apart, is not forgetting who God is in your life. You have been set apart. We talked about it a moment ago, that you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You have been set apart. You're not to be like anybody else, but God's saying, I have set you apart. My presence is with you. Everyone will know who you are because I'm walking with you. Are you hearing me today? I said, are you hearing me today? I got to move a little quicker. The, the next one, it says, don't touch what's God's. It's important for you not to touch what is God's. I think many of us get in the habit of touching stuff and it ain't yours to touch. You see signs that say don't touch and all of a sudden you're tempted. I'm a, they have boundary that don't touch that. Don't touch what is God's. The Bible says in Jeremiah 2 verse 3, it says Israel was holiness unto Jehovah. The first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall be held guilty. Evil shall come upon them, saith Jehovah. What is that saying? He's saying that Israel was his first fruits. When God brought Israel out, that was his first fruits. In other words, that was mine. Hey, guys, that's, Israel is mine. Don't touch Israel because Israel is mine. The first fruits are important when you live in royalty. First fruits are so important. Watch, get this. First fruits are so important. He says, my hand is on the first fruits. Don't touch it. And he literally declares, anyone that comes against Israel will be found guilty and my wrath is about to get on them. Some of you need to get excited because nothing that's coming against you is about to harm you because you are his first fruit. You are his chosen. You are the ones that God has declared to be his. You are a part of his holy nation. Whatever comes against you can't harm you because God is with you. In the same way, it's very important that, that we see that that was important to God. But in the flip side, it's also important for us to understand that his first fruits also comes from us. Our finances, our giving. It's very important for us to realize. When you look at the, at the, at the story of the children of Israel, when they were coming out and they were about to conquer the land, uh, when you look at, at Joshua and he goes into battle and the Lord tells him, I'm going to give you this battle, but whatever you get out of this battle, it don't belong to you. Offer it up as a sacrifice. Watch me. He goes to battle. They're in that battle. They win the battle. But all of a sudden, what happens is one of the guys, these guys, one of these guys decide to take some stuff for themselves. They bury it, and all of a sudden, they went into another battle, and they lost the battle. Why? Because they did not listen to God's instructions to say, don't touch what is mine. This first battle's mine, and the rest will be yours. I think many a times we get it confused. We're like, we got the battle. Let's go. Okay, but that first battle was God's battle. The very next battle that they went to, they, they suffered defeat because they did not understand first fruits. What if we've been experiencing failure because you don't honor first fruits? What if we're struggling so much because we're not honoring first fruits? 
What if you can't get the victory because you haven't dealt with whatever's buried under your rug? What if we just pull the rug and say, God, just take it already. God, I'm ready for the victory in my life. I can't get into the rest of it, but listen, second service, just hang out because we got, we're going to go deeper. Is that cool, Pastor Al? Or you better bring a keyboard or something that the way they know, like, it's wind down mode. But not really. There's a cool thing about being in a royal family. Royal family comes with some benefits. Someone say, yeah. I say, Algie, ready for that? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm ready. How many give me a few more moments? If there's anything I want you to do, I want you to begin to think about everything God has for you. For the next few moments, I want you to just dream a little bit. Just believe that God can do the impossible. Believe that God is able to do the unmeasurable. Believe that God is able to do the supernatural through your life. Can somebody say amen? amen. This is pretty cool. If there's anything I want you to do, I want you to send a signal to your future and let them know you're coming. I said, send a signal to your future and let them know you're on your way. Some of you got such a bright future ahead of you and you don't even realize it. The moment you stepped into these doors, your future got brighter. The moment you stepped into this place, hope came alive. The moment you stepped in the building, all of a sudden, all things became possible. You need to send a signal to your future. Let them know I'm coming and I'm coming for everything. I'm coming for everything. I'm going for it. Oh, I'm going for it. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 20. Can I give you just a little bit? Some of you need to go for your future. You need to start dreaming, believing, and saying, God, you're so good. I'm about, to, I'm about to wake up, and I'm about to get to my future. Deuteronomy 28, he says, For if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep his commandments, in other words, if you live royal, if you live under God, these are the things that I'm going to do for you. Verse 2, you will experience all these blessings if you obey God. Are you ready? Are you ready? Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Some of you are about to get so blessed. Some of you are about to walk into a brand new blessing. Your fields are about to blossom. Some of you have been sowing seed and sowing seed and sowing seed and sowing seed and being faithful, coming in, coming out, being there, being on time, being a servant. And he's saying, your field is about. Victory Outreach San Diego. You've been plowing. You've been moving. You've been showing up. You've been saying despite all odds, I am about to experience. You don't understand. You don't understand. It's not normal to have 1,600 people on an Easter. It's not normal to have that many South. It's not the field is about to be blessed. This house is about to experience something like it's never experienced before. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Get ready, surrounding areas, the towns and fields will be blessed just because God has planted this church in this city. It's there about to reap everything you have sown. How many give me a few more minutes? Oh my God, your children and your crops will be blessed. Somebody need your children to be blessed. 
He said, your children and your crops will be blessed. Somebody send a signal and say yes. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. In other words, everything that comes after you, everything that comes, the herds are, you aren't hearing me. Even the stinky area of your life is about to get blessed. That's a nasty play, the herds, but they are about to get blessed. He says, the offspring of your herds and flocks. San Diego, you're about to have an offspring. There's about to be an offspring. Some of you about to just, you about to go into it. I feel the signals going out to the future right now. Your fruit baskets and bread boards will be blessed. In other words, everything you carry, whatever you carry, boy, is about to be blessed. Then we check it out your fruit basket. Like, what kind of fruit you got? This is a different fruit. I got different fruit right here. They about to be blessed. Watch this. Wherever you go and whatever you do, wherever you go and whatever you do will be blessed. So that dream you have inside of you, if you learn how to put him first, if you learn what royalty is, you could send a signal to your future and say, wherever I go, whatever I do, it's about to be blessed because I know who I am. Your ministry is about to go to another level. Your business is about to go. It says whatever. It's not limited. Whatever. Whatever you could imagine, God is so much bigger than even that. So if you could imagine just a little bit and say, wherever I go, that's right. If you say, man, I want to be a blessing into this house, God's given me an idea. Well, step out in faith and whatever you put your feet on, God's about to give it to you. God's about to give it to you. Are you getting excited? I said, are you getting excited? Watch this, verse 7. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from every direction, but they will be scattered from you even seven different directions. I'm here to tell you, he's not just going to come against whatever is coming against you. He's about to split it into seven different things. In other words, he's going to hit it so hard that it can't keep standing anymore. It's about to break down. Some things in your life today are about to break down. It's about to break down. That depression is about to split into seven. Insecurity is about to... Doubt is about to, whatever you've been fearing is about to, something is about to split in your life because God is with you. Somebody say, I'm sending a signal. I want you to stand. Say, I'm sending a signal. You about to be blessed. You are no, no, you don't understand. Jules, can I bring it down just a little bit? You don't understand. You about to be blessed. You about to step into something that you always dreamed about. You're about to say, wait, all things are possible? Yes. You're about to get, I'm sending a signal because I ain't sent staying here no more. I'm headed your way it's coming it's coming I feel like this morning that there's some people that today they understand who they are after this sermon you're like ah I get it that's why they walk like that yeah oh 
that's why they always have a smile on their face. You're right. Oh, that's why it looks like nothing bothers them. That's right. Because we know who we are. We know who we serve. They don't bother us. You know, one thing I learned, man, seasons come and go. You can't be bothered by seasons. In Arizona, boy, we got this hot season. 110 type of season. Like hot, hot. Seasons come and go. In your walk with the Lord, if you're new to the church, seasons are going to come and go. The most important thing for you to understand is that you've been chosen that you are God's and God has a plan for your life. The other thing I, I learned, Pastor Al, about seasons is that I don't have to walk through seasons alone. I don't. For many years I tried and I ended up just stuck there for longer than I had to be. But what happened in my life, I said, man, I need you, God. And I learned how to lean on God, but not only lean on God, but lean on people. In seasons, man, I've been able to open up to some of my best friends and say, man, I'm going through this. Can you help me? Yeah, I got you. We lock arms and we pray. That's why it's important for you to stay connected in the body. Because in those seasons, because you'll have them, you got to know, hey, we need each other. I've called Pastor Miller a few times. He's helped me through some stuff. But I'll tell you what, it's important. And I feel like we're about to get into that new wave that new place in life, if you've been chosen, God has greater for you. Don't stay here. Say, I want everything God has for me. Is that you today? I want you to come quickly. If God has ministered to you, come quickly. Come quickly from all over this place.